Hello, everyone. Come on in the room. Let's give it a few minutes and then we shall get started. I'm excited. I haven't done this in a long time. Hopefully, everyone can hear me. Let's see here. Worship. All right. I used to have this together beforehand. All right, let's see. Just a few minutes, and then we shall get started. Today we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. I'm going to give it um, a few more seconds and then we shall get going. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Amen. Hello, hello. All righty. <laughs> All right, y'all. So let's get started here. For those who don't know, may catch us on the replay. This will also be available on YouTube. There's like a piece of hair here. Uh, this is also going to be available on YouTube. Um, my name is Samaria Colvin. I am the founder of Kingdom Creative Counseling. I'm a licensed therapist. I'm a published author, and I help people to get free, spiritually, emotionally, and mentally free through Jesus Christ. I have not done this in so long. It feels like it's been a long time, maybe two, three weeks. I've been so busy, you guys, um, and I have great ideas, and then this time gets past me. So I'm going to be talking about what does it mean to be broken trying to lead. And so before uh, we get dive into this, I'm not going to keep you long. My famous last words that I always say, so we can see how that can go. <laughs> Um, Father, we just thank you for today. Thank you for the people that will join. Um, thank you for the people that will watch the replay. Lord, let something be said, let something be heard, let something be done uh, that will prick our hearts to healing. And I thank you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you into this place. Amen. So y'all know what I am, um, Samaria. So let's talk about why did I uh, choose this topic. For those who don't know, I've released a series of books um, uh, as a therapist, as a counselor, uh, called Broken Trying to Lead. So let me give you my little shameless plug because we're going to talk about some stuff. Uh, this is the book. It's called Broken Trying to Lead. I'm doing good. I'm glad it sounds good. I'm actually filming for the first time in um, my other office. Yay! Um, and so uh, this is, I'm still trying to get the lighting together and trying to figure it all out. But um, but this is a book that I wrote come, uh, it's, it's a pretty extensive book called Broken Trying to Lead. And God birthed this book into me um, sometime, I want to say maybe even, I started working on it, really studying and, 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 and getting delving deep into it sometime last year. Um, and that was triggered because I started counseling um, leaders. When I say leaders in my private practice, uh, my background was doing trauma work. I'm sorry, there's something in my, I don't know what is going on. It's like a piece of hair or something. Anyway, so uh, my background is trauma, depression, anxiety, uh, integration, inner healing, stuff like that. And so, but what but began to happen within my business or, organically without me trying was other leaders started coming uh, to my um, practice for counseling. Um, and when I say leaders, I mean pastors, I mean uh ministers, I mean, licensed ministers, other therapists, other entrepreneurs, I mean, um, the, the people that you would consider leaders, uh, political leaders, all of these people, without me trying, without me advertising, without me saying, hey, I want to counsel leaders, 
God put these people in my in in my office. Um, I've always had a heart for leaders. I've always thought at some point in time in my life, God will give me an assignment directly to leaders. I didn't know when or how. I just always have studied um, for a very long time. However, um, in opening up my private practice and seeing the shift that happened without me even trying, I began to understand the brokenness of leaders in a way that I had I hadn't before. I understood like development. I understood process. I understood. I mean. You could you could go back ten years of books that I've written on process, but I didn't really go into as much detail about the brokenness. And so as these people begin to come, with, like I said, without me trying, literally, um, you know, anyone knows when you start a business, you always market to your target audience. Well, I didn't market to this target audience because I didn't know they were my target audience. I didn't ever never said that I was going to counsel leaders. Um, I said I wanted my trauma people. Without me trying, like literally 90% of the clients that I have seen or started seeing were all leaders in some capacity. Now, when I say leaders, I'm not just referring to uh, uh, ministry leaders. I'm referring to business, ministry, any any type of leadership in any capacity. Um, a lot of business, a lot of entrepreneurs, like I said, um, they just started coming. And literally 90% of my business were people who may not have necessarily had a a strong trauma background from what I was used to coming from where I came from as far as what I dealt with, but they had very, uh, very clear and profound brokenness. And so the Lord began to push me and to be, and, 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 and had me make it clear. He made it clear to me about my assignment. And one of my assignments was not just to counsel people who experience trauma, uh, was to, was to be a, a counselor to other leaders. And even now to this day, um, literally I get multiple calls, Every week I'm scheduling someone new uh, for counseling and nine times out of 10, they have some kind of leadership uh, capacity. And I always have to gear myself or, or prepare myself to uh, meet with people who have experienced, uh, who experienced a great deal of shame because they are thinking, oh my God, like I got to the point where I got to see a counselor. Like you see what I'm saying? Because people who are in leadership positions never, most of the time they don't, they think that that counseling is not something that they should be doing. And so uh, overcoming that hurdle and letting them know, no, it's okay for you to be here. And it's okay for you to be a counselor. And I also emphasize confidentiality. I have a specific, um, I have intake forms that you have to uh, fill out. But when someone has, maybe well, they're well known within the community or things of that nature, I have an extra, what we call intake packet or um, what do we call it? Um, form for them to fill out to, let, to help them to feel more comfortable. So it's like a social media form. I'm not going to acknowledge you on social media. I'm not going to follow you on social media. I'm not going to admit you're my client. Things like that that they may be very sensitive to. An uh, uh, extra disclosure that I may not necessarily have done with with your regular folks that may not necessarily be known within the community. Okay, so um. I didn't mean to say all that. I'm going to try to make it brief, y'all. So God birthed into me this information, broken trying to lead. And it breaks down from a Christian perspective what it means to be broken trying to lead, okay? And it broke, breaks it down from uh, from the biblical perspective. We look at and we dissect different leaders in the body of Christ. And then we also look at what we call pre and post. So that means before a person has even been put in a position of leadership, uh, what happens? And then also, how do we help to walk people through a leadership um, a, 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 who's already in a leadership position, which is kind of what I do, where they're already in position, they already have some kind of a platform, a certificate, a collar, degrees, some level of success, and then how do we still walk them through? So either way, if you're called to a leadership position, uh, you can you still need to be healed and walk through that healing process. But again, if you are that person who has been put in position, you're a pastor, you're an evangelist, you're a, you know what I'm saying, you're a licensed therapist, you're a teacher, you're a, you're a coach, whatever it is that you are, uh, I still help those people. A lot of times those people are already there, okay? Uh, and oh gosh, y'all help me. <sighs> Not help me, but y'all pray for me. Something is in my eye. Anyway, so uh, those are the people that I work with. Also, I, and I forgot to mention, I want, I, I'm doing this to set president, is that I met people outside of the counseling session that really needed counseling. But they were, I could see the pride that I could see. And I mean pride, I mean from a, a, a humble perspective, I could see how they, they didn't want to acknowledge 
their brokenness, but it's very clear to me as someone who God has called, chosen, and assigned to do this, that yeah, this person is very broken. I remember, as a matter of fact, even uh, maybe a week or so ago, um, the Lord, something was on my mind about another leader that I know. I don't know the person personally, but I know them. And I kept saying, God, well, why does that person respond that way? I mean, it's just so, uh, it's just so odd. And, um, and the Lord told me because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. And so he was, he, he was telling me the person struggle, even though they're a leader, they have some kind of certificate, they have a title, as in that, like a church title, but suffers with very low self-esteem amongst other things, okay? And so I say that to say it is the heart of the father for leaders to be healed and what happens is because leaders we are often leaders are often put in leadership position not because of their emotional capacity but because their gift a man gift makes room for him and brings him before great men so you are given a certificate you're given a title you're given a a a a, a mantle so to speak from man even though you're broken because you can perform very well you can dissect scripture you can um uh, you can preach you are a nice person like you see what i'm saying you do you produce as from a business perspective you produce you were that person that it's on it but you're still broken okay and most people don't really have the capacity because that's just not what their assignment is to really say okay this person is struggling in the area because that takes discernment and the holy spirit this person is struggling area let me not put you in position quite yet and help me to develop you. There's not really a, a context from, there's a lot of leadership development, but, but what, what, how do you, in, how do you also incorporate in any situation where you have to develop leaders? How, to, how do you incorporate their brokenness? Because what happens is going to impact them in a powerful way. This is why when you see the statistic about uh, particularly ministry leaders and how many ministry leaders, particularly pastors suffer with depression. I don't have the statistics right in front of me, but I did do some stats. Uh, as a matter of fact, I wrote in this book somewhere. When we have pastors and leaders who are committing suicide, that's a problem. And we got to do something differently. Okay, when you have business leaders who are committing suicide and being put in prison and stuff like that, that's an issue. We have to deal. We can't ignore it anymore. So I believe that God has provided an answer, um, not just from a, a, like I said, just a straight leadership development uh, perspective or a straight business perspective or a straight ministry perspective but also from the from the uh from it answers the question how do we develop leaders but also incorporating their brokenness and helping them to heal so they can be more effective and most importantly whole because the last thing you want is a leader who is broken Okay, now, and they may be able to perform and pop, pop, pop in front of other people and be on point and behind closed doors. It's a whole nother story. I know leaders who are so afraid they can perform their own point. If you don't know the person personally, you don't know. But you see, my ears open to the Holy Spirit, so I be hearing stuff. They can, they can, they, and people love them. And then outside of that, they are so afraid they can't even really speak or really engage with people because they're so broken. Now, let me just say this. I'm not coming from the perspective, from, from the perspective of putting anybody down or, 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 or anything like that. I'm just telling you, this is what I'm assigned to do. So I got to call it like it is. And God wants us healed. Okay. So this is what, um, this is a book. Okay. And I'm going to break down some uh, 10 points and I'm going to try to make, uh, let us go here. And there's four workbooks. Okay. One, two, three, four. So if you need to be, if you need to walk through the healing process, but also if you think, gosh, I am called to leadership development and I want to incorporate within the context of my ministry, my business, my whatever program that you have, whatever you're doing, I need to understand from a pathological, emotional, and spiritual level how to work with someone that's broken. These are for you. I'm also coming out with the online training program. One well, no thing that got delayed because I've been, uh, crazy busy but it's gonna come out i'm trying to make it before the end of uh i, I said the end of september i mean august but that's not gonna happen so we're gonna have to uh <laughs> reevaluate that but it is coming out as well okay so what does it mean to be broken trying to lead now, if i was teaching a class uh, and I would say, stop, students. Now, y'all brainstorm with me and tell me what it means to be broken trying to lead. And we just kind of discuss it. But that's not what this is. I'm going to give you 10 points. There are more. This is not an all-inclusive list, but it is something we have to deal with. So when you are broken trying to lead, it means you are leading from a place of emotional, spiritual, or mental deficit. 
Okay, point number one, leading from a place of emotional, spiritual, or mental deficit. Okay, so let me kind of go back a bit because I got ahead of myself. What I'm not suggesting is that if you're called to a leadership position, you have to be perfect. I'm not saying that you have to cross every I and dot every T. There's a difference between you're growing in an area versus there's a major stronghold. Okay, there's a big difference between that. Okay, as long as you are on this earth, no matter what leadership capacity that you have, you should be growing and developing. God should be able to pour more into you. And sometimes as he does that, as we go from valley to valley, and as he begins to elevate us, he begins to also dig deep within us and take us to the next level. And that, that, that incorporates self-evaluation, okay? So not suggesting that you have to be perfect, but there's a difference between God is developing me and making me better versus I have a stronghold, okay? Um, so leading from a place of emotional, spiritual, and mental deficit. Before I wrote this book, one thing God told me, he said, oftentimes people seek leadership positions out of a need for affirmation and validation. Not because of the call, not because of the cause, not because of the purpose, out of a need for validation and affirmation. They were broken in childhood. They had mother and father wounds. They had an orphan spirit. And then they learned that if I perform well, if I preach well, if I can do business well, if I can make people money, if I can play sports well, then I get this superficial or almost a false sense of, of confidence because of what I can do and not who I am. I am a child of God. Okay, and I am worthy because God has called me, not because I'm performing, I have a business, and I'm Samaritan, not because of who I am, oh, oh, not, I'm sorry, not because of what I can do, but because of who God has created me to be, okay? So we seek leadership positions for raw motives to begin with. So if, when you're leading from a place of emotional, spiritual, and mental deficit, okay? Point number two, leading while broken or damaged. Leading while broken or damaged, Okay? Now, again, people around you may not see your brokenness. They think, okay, Joe Blow, he can still preach or Joe Blow is still making us money, not knowing outside that Joe Blow is really broken and damaged. Now, broken and damaged comes from different places. It could come from childhood. It comes from betrayal. Sometimes when you are trying to deal with, uh, can I, can I say, can I say, uh, church folk or Christians or, uh, or just people in general, when you are dealing, we live in a day in society that people can be real ratchet and everybody's offended. And so people will, will intentionally betray you and smile in your face like it ain't nothing. So, but if you're not, if, if you allow that to, to cause you to be broken or damaged in some way, it sets root in us. It creates bitterness. It creates um, a sense of, 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 of deep, deep, deep sorrow, but you're still leading from that place. Of trying to lead from that place. Okay. Point number three, leading from a place of emotional unavailability. There's actually a book. It's not a Christian book. It's a really good book. It's called Emotional Unavailability. I just finished out and highlighted and, and, and took notes and everything like that. And it talks about the reason why people are emotionally unavailable. And that is because they are broken and they are afraid. So they keep people at arm's length. So that's another sign. When you're dealing with a leader and they just, they are extremely guarded. They never talk. I mean, you just ask. I was just thinking. Also, I know someone else is another leader. Lord help me. Uh, I know another leader. You can ask the person a basic question, and they they will not give you an, a a direct answer. I mean, it's it's real simple. What do you like to do? You don't know nothing about the person. You know why? Because they're very broken. They're very broken, and they keep people at an emotional distance. Now, at a, at a distance. Now, what I'm not saying is that you be led by your emotions. And you be a lay, I mean, you know what I'm saying? You don't want your emotions to leave. That's not what we want to do. But when you're so cold, when you're broken, when you, when you just can't deal with people in general and, and everyone is, 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 is you, you guard yourself from everyone. You isolate and no one wants to be around you. That means you are an emotionally unavailable person. The people who are in relationships, whole marriages, whole, uh, you know, family members, people trying to raise children from a place of emotional unavailability and that's really rooted in fear they have been hurt in the past they have not resolved that and their emotions keep people at a distance because they know eventually you're going to hurt them so they don't trust anybody so whenever you have a leader who says i don't deal with people which i've heard a leader say leaders say I just don't deal with people. You know that person is broken because, and I'm and I'm coming from a place of love, but it may come harsh. 
How can you build a business when you don't deal with people? How can you build a ministry when you don't deal with people? The first thing you have to do is deal with people, particularly in ministry because you deal with people that you deal with other people that are broken. So if you cannot deal with people and you're a leader, you need to let me bring bring it down, come from a place of love. You need to work that out and really walk through your healing process because you if you cannot deal with people, you cannot lead. Now, there are certain boundaries you got to set with people. You got to set certain expectations. Sometimes you have to be stern. You can't always be homegirl, friend girl. Sometimes you got to tell people, listen, in love, this is what the Lord is saying. This is what I need you to do. You have to lead. But if you can't deal with people and you shut yourself off from the world and you just don't deal with people, you are a broken person. And I said this, and I'm going to say, somebody took my little quote, right? Wrote a whole page on it. And I'm like, well, that's good what you said. You was right, but you you took what I said out of context, okay? And the word, what I said was, I'm not mad. I'm just, I'm just saying it was out of context. Uh, I said that the energy that you give is the energy that you will receive. The energy that you, the energy that you give is the energy that you receive. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, this, what's the word? What's the, this new age energy? I'm talking about the, <laughs> the vibe that you get. And so what I meant by the, the content, because content can add context, two things. Context is important. Okay. The content is the information. The context is the surroundings by which something is being stated. Okay. The context for what I was saying was that is that, uh, oftentimes we become offended when people don't want to help us to build our ministry. They don't want to help us to build our business. They don't, people don't want to deal with us, but you came off to people as if you didn't, like you said, you have to meet somebody and they just real antisocial. Well, you can't get mad at people that want to deal with you if you're antisocial. Like you see what I'm saying? I mean, when you, you see, it just, it just don't, it don't make sense. Like you said, if you don't want to deal with people, if you're not giving it to people, if, if you come across as so broken that you just, you, you, you are away from people. No people are not going to help you in any capacity. No people are not going to show up for your events. Nobody, I, if I was like, oh, stand up, I would have any clients. Like you see what I'm saying? Nobody wants to hang around or deal with, you cannot leave people from a place of that distance and then be mad and posting and talk about, well, I'm haters and people and, and, and like, Cutting people off and I'm dealing with people, blah, blah, blah. But you gave, that's what you gave to other people. You, as a leader, you said you were a leader, but that's what you gave to other people. You, you show people that you didn't want to deal with them. So don't get mad when you really do need help and you really do need people. And the people that God would have assigned to you to help you are not willing to help you because you were so, you didn't know how to deal with people correctly. Like, you see what I'm saying? Like, that's the context. If you want to build people, if you want to be in relationships, if you want to be, uh, y'all know I'm single, but I, one day I'm going to get married. If I want to get married, if you want to build a business, if you want to build a ministry, you have to, you have to be what you want. You have to be friendly to attract friends. You have to be friendly to attract, to attract friends. You have to be someone that wants to pour into other people. If you want other people to pour into you. Okay, we don't we don't want people to be um, can I can I keep it real? I'm gonna keep it. We don't want people behind the pulpit uh preaching and prophesying, but behind, but when you get off the stage, you're a mess. And you 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 see what I'm saying? It it doesn't I come from a place where it doesn't work that way. And the reason I'm saying this is because it's time to get healed. It's time to get healed from for, for leaders, okay? Um, so the energy that you give, poke that one, the energy that you give out is what you're going to attract. Not what you desire. If you desire, you see what I'm saying? If you desire to pour into the lives of people, then you need to reflect someone that people want to hang around and to be poured into. Okay, that makes good sense. That's what you want. That's what you want. But if you come, like I said, if you come across as your vibe is all like standoffish. And let me let me just be clear about this because I put myself on totem pole first. Let me put. Let's talk about Samaria. Nobody that I deal with now are people that I dealt with 10 years ago, as far as a business perspective. Every client that I have, every person who's reached out to me a business or a speaking engagement or whatever, for whatever reason, they didn't know me 10 years ago. You know why they didn't know me 10 years ago? I was a very broken person 10 years ago. I was starting to go through my healing process, but I wasn't quite there. So even though I had Kingdom Creative Counseling in my, in my head, even though I had degrees, in, in actual physical degrees, now that kind of degree, of course, on my wall, even though I was still working with people, even though I have a, on paper, I had accomplished a lot, I was not someone that people would say, gosh, you know, Samaria, I really want to work with her in counseling. 
I want her to speak at my event. Now, I'm not saying I'm, I'm, I'm at the pivotal, pivotal of a success. I'm not. I'm just, I'm, I do have a business growing and I'm grateful to God for that. And it, to me, it's successful because it's growing and it's, you know, I'm saying it's paying for itself basically from a business perspective. Okay. So I'm not saying that, but I can honestly tell you from that perspective that the people that I deal with now are dealing with the whole Samaria. The whole person that's healed, that's not perfect, that's still got things to work on, that's healed and whole. So now that increases and now people are attracted to my business or what I have to say in any capacity because I'm healed. Thank you, Jesus. I'm healed by the grace of God. But 10 years ago, I was saying, like, I don't understand why I had this business. And I, and I had to listen, let me have a couple of Jesus moments with Samaria 10 years ago because you're antisocial. Nobody wants to deal with somebody. If you don't have confidence in yourself, nobody's going to deal with you. That's me 10 years ago. Now, because I'm healed, now I'm in position to pour. Now I'm seeing my dreams manifest. Now. But real fact, I knew I was going to have this business 2002. I started school. I'll tell you how old I am, y'all. I'm, I'm not as old as I look. But I started school in the late 90s. on college. So the point I make with all that is that it's okay. You got to work on your healing. Okay. I'm a good, when I'm on the tag, y'all help me, help me. Okay. Keep moving. So you can't leave people when you don't trust and you isolate. It doesn't. Now the difference between us, introverted people who, you know, who gain energy from being by ourselves, who go away and spend time with the father. That's not what I'm talking about. <clears throat> okay. I'm not, not referring to that. I'm talking about if you generally have a genuine, you can tell when someone generally have a mistrust of people. Like I said, you ask them a basic question and they just like really just, it just, they just don't know what to say. But you generally don't trust. Now God can ask us to put all our eggs in one basket and trust everybody can explicitly with everything. You got to use some wisdom. But you, 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 if you say I struggle with trust issues, that's a broken place. If you isolate, not isolate to work, not isolate to be with the father, not isolate because you're an introvert, but you isolate intentionally from people because you don't want to be around them, that's a broken place. All right? Leading while experiencing chronic, chronic is a keyword here, chronic depression, anxiety, and stress. Now, let's be clear. Stress and anxiety are not the same thing. However, chronic stress that is not dealt with over time will turn into anxiety and it will turn into depression, which could potentially turn into something more of a stronghold. Now I can break that real down, but I'm going to leave it there. Chronic depression, chronic anxiety. Um, so let me, I, I can, I'm not, I'm not, <laughs> but uh, okay. Leading to seek validation or affirmation from people. Now, don't get me wrong. The need for validation and affirmation, we all, we, that's a need we all have. Like you want people to at least at some point appreciate you or appreciate your work. So I'm not saying that you're so deep and you're like, I don't care about anything. You're like, you know what I'm saying? But when, when that's your motive, and sometimes you don't know what your motives are until God reveals it to you. You, God, you can be thinking, I just, I just want to affect the kingdom for God. You know, we just, oh, ha, sha, ba, ba. But God, and but God will reveal to you that no, you're seeking that from a place of value. Let me be honest. Again, put Samaria on a total pole. When God first revealed to me my purpose, my destiny, when I was 17 years old, many, many, many years ago, um, I would think often about it. But I, honestly, my motive for seeking it was not necessarily because I had a voice because God was going to use me because of, I wanted to advance his kingdom because I wanted people to be healed, whole, or set free. That was not my motive back then. Okay, that was not my motive. It was a long time ago. Okay, my motive then was to prove people who ignored me, who rejected me, who didn't like me, who 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 didn't acknowledge me, who told me I wasn't gonna be anything. To prove to them, see, ha 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 ha, look at me now. That was a ha, look at me. I'm I'm somebody that you didn't even think I'd be. That's a broken place. You're needing you're 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 seeking leadership from a need of validation. Now, I, again, like I said, I'm whole. I don't care what you think about me. I don't need validation from people. I genuinely am in a place in my life where what I have to say, I know what I have to say, and I'm, and I'm committed to my relationship with God. I'm not seeking. Uh, God's not opening up doors for me from a place of impure motives. Okay. So leading um, out of place and out of time. I said this in a, in a live I did, 
I don't remember. <laughs> I think it was called assignment. And so I talk about how there's a specific place and a specific place for you. There's also a specific time for you. And so what happens is you can be trying to lead from a place out of, uh, that's out of place and, and, and out of your timing. For example, I have had this uh, this happen. Uh, well, example, not I've not had this happen, but people that I've counseled in the counseling session. I've had adult people, okay, who have maybe adult sons or adult daughters, and they're still trying to raise them, but they're adults. That would be an example, and that's a real simple example. There are other ones of leading out of place in time. Like for me, my mother is in Maryland. She's always going to be my mother, but she does not call me first thing in the morning to pick out my clothes. She does not pay my bills. She does not call me to wake up. She does not help me to bathe or shower. I guess what I'm saying that's out of place and out of time. But when I was two, you know, she that's what had happened. <laughs> <laughs> when I was two years old, I'm not two. So you know what I'm saying? So that that's a real simple example. There's other examples of that. You know, maybe God has told you, and I said this before on a Facebook that, you know, you're stuck at an organization or, or at a church that God has clearly told you that your time is up here, but you keep staying there because you're stuck in loyalty. I'm not at that place either, but I've had to make that decision as well, where to leave a place that I'm familiar with to go to a place that I'm not familiar with. I'm from Maryland. I live in I live in North Carolina. I've been here a long time, but I had to leave. And so, uh, again, when I give examples for myself, I just want to make sure that I'm not bragging. I'm just telling people because I I I, I want people to understand that I've been there, done that. You see what I'm saying? And I, and I want other people to get free. But you can lead out of us out of a wrong place and out of the wrong timing. Or sometimes you're trying to lead, and it's not your timing. God is saying, I'm trying to birth something in you. I'm trying to develop you. I'm trying to prepare you, but it's not your time to lead yet. And you're steady trying to push doors open that God is saying, wait a minute, hold up. I got to finish processing you yet. Okay. The, the sons of Sceva are a great example of that. Okay. Uh, they was just wrong. Uh, leading with wrong motives, attempting to lead when you are unattached, unavailable to your assignment. Say that again. Attempting to lead when you are unattached, unavailable, or uncertain of your assignment. Your assignment needs to be clear to you, okay? And I did, like I said, did a live called assignment. Uh, it'll make some things clear to you, but you have to know what your current assignment is. And I said in that live, your purpose may stay the same, but your specific assignment may change, okay? Like when I first started my business, I gave you an example. I was all seeing all trauma people. That was that was my people. Those were people I seen for well over uh, years. I mean, years. These are my people. These are, I'm just doing the exact same thing when I work with someone else. I'm doing it from my own private practice, seeing the same people. God shifted my assignment as well. I still see trauma people, but 90% of people coming to my door are the leaders, okay? So that'll be an example. You have to be clear about what your current assignment is is okay leading with unrepressed and not dealt with wounds okay that manifests as mother or father wounds that is a real thing if you don't deal with mother or father wounds they will still be there okay um leading from an orphan spirit leading from a place of brokenness you still have are, are, are experiencing a heart related to betrayal and abandonment betrayal and abandonment could come from family friends previous church experiences it can come from anyway any area of wound a broken relationship divorce uh, uh, abandonment, all kinds of things, but you're trying to lead and that's still there. You still have mother or father wound. You still are, have an orphan spirit. You still, uh, experience, uh, the betrayal and the abandonment. Okay. Uh, so we're leading from, from that place. Okay. And so there's more than I could add to that. There's all, I mean, listen, this book is y'all, you see this book right here. This is a long book. There's so much more, but for the sake of time, those are just basically 10 that I thought of, and there's so much more. And we really can break down mother and father wounds. That's what we see a lot within leaders. That's what I see within practice. A lot of the leaders I, I, I see have I still have unresolved mother and father wounds, uh, rejection. They have really hu I mean, huge issues from the orphan spirit. Now, there's other things when you, you start seeing patterns, when you start seeing a different client, same issue, like different client same issue okay and and the theme is the same like you know orphan spirit is huge huge within certain communities uh father wounds are huge a huge issue we are living in a day and time where people have been brought up whole families have been brought up without a, a real strong father and this world is feminist world i'm not a feminist 
I can talk about that, kind of dissect that. Don't call yourself a feminist, okay? Uh, but there is re there is clear research that feminist is not of God. It's not of God. I can I can listen. I, I can prove it, but not on this live today. <laughs> um, but this huge feminist agenda, and where women hear me roar. Nothing wrong with that. I am a woman that's very much in power. However, I can be a woman that's empowered. I call myself a proper 31 woman who has not found, you know, the man had not come yet, but I'm a proper 31 woman. But there's a difference between um, um, a woman being empowered and, and emasculating a man for a woman to be empowered. That's not Proverbs 31. That's feminist agenda. A man has to be emasculated for, for this agenda to, to, to come forth. Now, uh, when you are a woman of God, you can walk in power, authority, and dominion, and you don't have to emasculate anybody to do that. We walk in covenant as God has called us to. But, but there's a whole agenda where it's emasculating men, taking them out of the home. And now we have whole generations of men who don't know their identity and women who don't know their identity because there was no strong father within the home. Okay, so huge father wounds and mother wounds, okay? Uh, so last few things and we are good to go. God allows or creates deficits in us. So our complete dependence is on, is on him. I'm going to prove that. Let me say that again. We almost done y'all. God allows and even creates deficits in us so that our complete dependence is on him. Okay. I'm going to leave with this cl uh, cliffhanger. Who does God call to lead? First thing we know is that God calls the broken into himself. God calls the broken unto or into himself. He calls them, okay? God also calls the rejected. So when you study leadership development from a biblical perspective, a theme that you will always find is that most of the leaders experience some type of rejection from their family of origin. They also experience brokenness, okay? Uh, going back to David, there's a reason why David was outside tending the sheep and his brothers were all inside. Going back to Joseph, Joseph was rejected by his brothers. Uh, uh, Jesus was rejected by, he came amongst his own and his, uh, his own, excuse me, he came amongst his own and his own did not receive him. Um, if, so if you really look at the path, that, like how that works, the system, look at the order of God. He does not choose the one that's great and one for the mighty. He chooses the rejected. Okay, we know this because First Samuel 16, 17, man looketh at the heart, but man looketh at the outward appearance, but I look at the heart. Man look at the outward appearance, I look at the heart. Then First Corinthians says this, that God chose the things despised by the world. Things counted as nothing at all and used them to bring nothing bring to nothing what the world considers important that's a profound scripture of how god chooses um there's another thing i just uh broke this down okay I'm trying to find what i just okay i can't find what i just uh found what i just discovered give me this it's really important so god chose chooses those who have been despised what does despise me i'm gonna look it up in a minute i just screenshotted it and um so God chooses the spot. If you look at the New King James Version, it says something very similar. The base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen. And the things which are not to bring to nothing, those things that are. So despise me to feel strong dislike for someone. To feel strong dislike for someone because you think that that person is no good or has no value. That's the definition of it. God chooses those people. He chooses, in other words, are loath, disdain, reject, detest, scorn, hate. So God chooses these kinds of people. He chooses them. So again, I'm not saying in order to lead, you got to be perfect. God chooses the people that feel rejected. God chooses the people that everybody don't like. God chooses those people. And what happens is um, God chooses that so our dependency will be on him. And he still wants to heal us. Because when you've been rejected, when, when you have learned that God is your source, he is the one that will heal you and you will be his. 
People that have never gone through anything, if God gives them position, power, or authority, they become prideful. They become arrogant. They begin thinking they're all at the bag of chips. But God chooses to despise. <clears throat> but we still have a responsibility to get healed so that we're not, God does not want us to be broken trying to lead. He wants, he does not want us to be broken trying to lead, even though he chooses us in our brokenness. That's why he, he has ordained a process of healing for leaders. Okay, now I'm going to leave on this cliffhanger. I feel so bad, y'all. There is so much more that I can say. But our time is up for today. Again, you can find this on Amazon.com, SamariCobra.com, uh, uh, TransformingChristianLeaders.com is another website. If you want to know more about, or more about my business, it's called Kingdom Creative Counseling. You go to www.kingdomcreativecounseling.com. We will be talking further about this. I'm going to get my lighting fixed in my other office here. And we're going to talk a little bit more about this. But remember, God wants his leaders healed. And guess what? Last thing I'm going to say, y'all. I know I keep saying this. Um, but ignoring it, being in denial, and, and self-deception is not going to get you healed. So you said, no, I'm fine. I'm good. I'm, I'm good. I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm wonderful. It's just, it's, I'm fine. It just, no other form that gets me shall Are you real, real religious about that? It's not going to get healed by happenstance. You have to be an active participant in your own healing and you have to acknowledge that. Again, you got to also come out with a training program for those who are called to develop leaders. It's basically already finished. I just got to finish uploading it and recording it. Um, as well. Okay. Thank you guys so much. We will be back a different time. We will continue to talk about this theme. Okay. This theme of broken trying to lead. I'm just going to give you, I just gave you some tidbits today. We're going to go back and we'll talk a little more about this. All right. God bless y'all. Have a wonderful, wonderful remainder of your evening. Bye.